again, I apologise for being a, another medievalist here standing up in front of you. Um, but I hope even for you non-medievalists, you'll find some interest in this paper. Um, the paper I'm going to give today is going to draw upon Henri Lefebvre, Lefebvre's conception of the, of the socially produced nature of space and Alfred Gell's theory of the agency of art to explore the ways in which medieval religious objects may have shaped medieval spaces. Now, originally I was going to give you a really in-depth paper looking at early medieval religious art and then later medieval religious art and sort of discuss the ways in which the changing representation of space within religious art would have affected medieval practice. I realised that with 20 minutes and with two minutes already gone, that would be too ambitious. So I'm going to focus down on one particular object after I first talk a bit about the theory. Now, in accounting for change in the British medieval countryside, scholars have proposed at heart an explanation grounded in either demography, agriculture, lordship, commercialisation or the environment. In all cases, the landscape and material culture is seen as a passive backdrop, something which is shaped by and therefore representative of social and economic forces. There is, however, a growing acceptance among medieval archaeologists the current approaches have only taken us so far in understanding the true complexity of medieval landscape change. Regardless of the merits or limitations of existing exp explanatory frameworks, in all cases, little thought is given to the materiality of everyday life. When they do consider mid material culture, it tends to be on market orientated or agrarian orientated technology. So for example, there's been lots of discussions on the medieval plough and things related to this. But there's little consideration as to how, say, religious art objects or objects deemed social could have affected or influenced practice and therefore, by extension, a landscape. This is in contrast to the arts and humanities and social sciences more widely, where there really has been in the last decade or two, a real attention focused on notions of relationality, networks, personhood and material agency. This body of work, which belongs to the tradition of post-structurist thought, places the locus of human subjectivity in practice and focuses upon the relationships between agents and their mutually material, sorry, and social contexts. And again, uh, Rob um, in 2010 had a fantastic article outlining this tradition of thought. Um, in contrast, though, to the initial post-structuralist critique of people like Foucault, Bourdieu, and Anthony Giddens, the emphasis has really shifted from simply viewing social action from the perspective of human pro protagonists faced with um, passive objects and material culture. Instead, the focus is now looking at the relationships between material culture or material objects, human beings, animals, etc. Okay? This work serves as an explicit challenge to traditional approaches, those which are grounded in Descartes' cogito proposition, whereby matter must attach from thought. Space was conceived as the extension of matter, whilst human subjectivity was firmly rooted in the mind. <clears throat> okay. Now, as of yet, relational ways of thinking, with the exception of people like Ben, really haven't made much of an impact on medieval archaeology and virtually no impact in medieval landscape archaeology. But this is really a shame because actually when you look at well-documented instances of medieval agency or how people understood causality in the medieval world, many people often saw objects such as religious relics or substances such as water, fire um, or salt etc as having the ability to influence or affect um, things in nature or, or, or humans or animals etc okay 
Um, this is perhaps no better uh, demonstrated than on the three days than, than in religious festivals, um, festivals such as Rogentide, um, where most parishes preambulated through their fields in the parish bounds. The processions were led by a priest and at various points along the route, open air services were conducted in which the land and boundary markers were blessed. This Christian rite of spring, whereby the land and crops were blessed, was seen by medieval com communities as an essential act for ensuring a successful harvest. The act of preambulation also served to define the spatial limits of the community and to also define access and rights over land and resources. Now a key part of these processions was the carrying by certain members of the uh, congregation of banners and icons which represented various biblical characters, one being the dragon. Now the dragon was supposed to re represent Pontius Pilate and this strip figure was supposed to lead procession. Now on the final day of the three-day three -day festival the tail of the dragon was actually cut off and the purpose of this was to demonstrate the submission or the driving out of the devil. Now the icons, icons themselves were actually viewed as being the force at work in driving out the devil. So it's not just a symbolic thing this, it's important to state that the icons themselves were seen as being able to actually physically push the devil out of the limits of the community or the parish. Um, the relationship between objects and agency in the medieval world is even more explicit perhaps when looking at baptism. Um, the act of baptism as it is today is seen by, was seen by medieval people as a transformative event whereby the individual was cleansed of original sin and it was also the point at which they entered into the Christian community. By the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, infant baptiz baptism was firmly established and the rite had come inside the church near the south door. Prior to that, it tends to be in the porch or in the churchyard. A key part of the ceremony was the priest blessing both salt and baptismal water. And through the act of blessing, the salt and the water was transformed into, into something with the power to cleanse the soul and again to drive out the devil. Um, as Eamon Duffy, the famous uh, religious historian, writes, everything about the Rogation Tide processions and the baptismal rites, rites sorry, emphasised the objective power of holy words, gestures and, my emphasis, things over the devil. The power which medieval people attributed to the baptismal water can be, well, sorry, the power medieval people attributed to the baptismal water necessitated even in most medieval churches a wooden cover being added to the tops of the fonts as a protection against the theft of the water. Um, and there were many instances of parishioners stealing water and sprinkling it over sick animals or over fields to ensure a successful harvest. So this is seen, these material objects or substances were really seen as having effective power the ability to drive away the devil and to prevent misfortune falling upon people, animals or even inanimate objects such as houses and fields or crops. Um, and now I'm just going to briefly look at the sort of theoretical background of today's paper. So I've briefly sort of talked a bit about notions of medieval agency and material agency. I'm just briefly going to talk about Alfred Gale's um, conception of the agency of art. Um, in 1998, Alfred Gale published um, a book in which, it was published shortly after his death, I, I believe, in which he talked about material agency or the agency of art objects. His theory has become quite prominent in material cultural studies because it really challenges the strict dichotomy between the mind and the body, people objects, and the natural and the uh, artificial worlds. Now, Gale peppered his discussion of agency with examples of how certain objects may serve as the equivalent of persons or social agents. For instance, he discussed both children's dolls and religious idols as possessing passive agency the kind of agency which is attributable to social others who or which by definition are only the target of agency 
never the independent source. These objects have agency because the humans who interact with them attribute to them an, an intentional psychology so that the object acquires something like a spirit, a soul, an ego lodged within. Again, in keeping with more relational approaches, Gale concluded that social agency is relational. It's a combination of people, things, animals, etc. Now the second body of theory I'm going to draw upon is Lefebvre's, and I apologise for my French, um, notion of the social production of space. In 1974, Lefebvre published The Production of Space, with the English language edition being published in 1991. He begins by suggesting that until recently the dominant view of space was based on Descartes' division between res cogitans and res extensia, again this mind-body division. Kant, Immanuel Kant, in the 18th century in an attempt to reconcile the traditions of rationalism and empiricism further complicated the picture by conceiving of space and time as a priori categories. In other words, both were reducible to empty categories of experience. Now Lefebvre departs, importantly departs from both these positions by stating that space is a social product and therefore needs to be understood in the context of the mode of production of a particular period. So it's not an empty category of experience, as in Kant's definition, nor is it something external to the mind, in Descartes' definition of space. It's something which is produced by us. Um, by shifting the emphasis um, or the definition of space onto that of it being produced, of course it, ro it roots space in particular periods and particular times. Now, I should stress that by production, Lefebvre does not mean production just in an economic sense, but in a broader sense to include the production of society, knowledge, institutions, and of course time and space itself. Therefore, production is both a mental and material process. Given that the production of space is both a mental and material process, in order to understand space, the concrete and the abstract, or perhaps the physical and the mental, need to be understood together. Now, we actually at this point reach a conceptual triad. Okay, so Lefebvre determines that we actually have three types of space. We have conceived space, um, so mental space. We have actual lived space, um, which he calls um, which sorry we have spatial practice which is the concrete concrete realization of space and we have a third type of space which is lived space now lived space is the com is a combination of sort of spatial practice and conceptions held of space so if you think about it in the sense that I have a view um, of my house I have a conception of where I live but I also have a way of acting and being in that space now the two of those things come together to produce lived space. Now you can start to see the relationship between this way of thinking and the work of people like Heidegger again who talk about dwelling um, and other sort of philosophers of that tradition. Um, just to sort of um, give you an example which relates directly to a medieval experience, um, an example of a space that incorporates both mental and material construct is a cloister where a, gest a gestural space has succeeded in grounding a mental space, one of contemplation and theological abstraction, thus allowing it to express itself, to symbolize itself, and to come into practice. Now, I'm going to move off theory and talk about some archaeology um, very briefly. Now, this is the font in uh, Parish Church in South Yorkshire, Thorpe Salvin. Um, it's been described as Roman S. Um, I suspect it probably dates from about 1200 or the late sort of uh, 12th century. Um, now the font sits at the back of the nave of the church. The nave of the church itself dates to the 12th century. So we can be fairly sure that the font and the nave are roughly contemporary. Um, 
as you can see, the exterior of the font is decorated, but I should stress that only the visible part of the exterior is decorated. The bit against the back wall, the west wall of the church, is plainly decorated. Now, upon entering the church, through the south door, the main door of the church, what you become immediately aware of is the baptism scene in front of you. Um, it's a famous scene in medieval archaeology. It depicts the act of baptism, perhaps two parents, an infant, and two god godparents standing behind, the priest holding the infant above the baptismal font. Um, what I'd like to draw attention to is, if you look at the topmost figure, there's a man standing there looking away. There's almost like a lifelike pose here. Um, he's almost beckoning us or invisible others not in the scene to come forward to witness the rite being performed. Um, I'd also like you to keep in mind Alfred Gale's conception of art invoking in us intentions or invoking in us the a sense of bestowing intentions upon the object. And when you start to look at this depiction you start to form intentions as to what those people are thinking and of course you start to form expectations or intentions as to what they're expecting of us. And I think they're very much expecting us to join and partake in the rite being performed. Now, moving in an anti-clockwise direction, we then have a series of scenes which are taken from the labours of the month uh, motif or pictorial sequence. We have harvesting, which represents summer. We have this scene, which is traditionally interpreted as a man hawking or riding in autumn. I think actually it shows rogation. And I talked earlier about the dragon icon. I think actually what we have here is somebody carrying an icon associated with rogation, perhaps the dragon. The next scene, again continuing in an anti-clockwise direction, is a man sewing. And the final scene is a man, or the final scene depicting a person, shows a man warming himself by the fire uh, enjoying winter. Now, it should become apparent from looking at these scenes that they actually form a sequence. We have winter, spring, late spring, and summer. We also have a life sequence. We have the beginning of life, followed by spring. Again, there's a real natural crossover between those two. We then have the sort of activities of the agricultural year, followed by the winter scene which perhaps represents death. One thing which I would like to draw attention to is this item here, which has been interpreted as some sort of uh, brazier or some sort of um, fireplace. Now, of course, when this font was uh, built, uh, uh, carved, sorry, fireplaces didn't really exist in, domestic, didn't exist in domestic settings. So there's something I think going on. It's not just simply a man warming himself by fire. I suspect what you have is a conception of the afterlife. You have the mouth of hell represented by the fire, the entrance, and above that you have a tiered understanding of purgatory and at the top, heaven. Um, I refer you to Dante's um, conception of heaven and the medieval order and you'll start to see there's a similarity in the, in the visual imagery there. Um, now the point I'm trying to get at is that Typically, objects such as the font here have been related back to some aspect of high culture. So the classical or the high or elite aspects of the imagery here is what has been the focus of scholarly concern or research. But I'm saying actually we need to move beyond that. We need to understand how this item is experienced within the space of the church. Now, one thing I should stress is that these scenes depict these scenes, sorry, face different parts of the church and different parts of the church building have different connotations attached to them. So we have the baptism scene which looks south. Again, that's a fairly obvious thing because that's where the baptism rite was carried out. As the seasons progressively warm through the year from winter through to summer, so the scenes progressively face the warmer parts of the church space. So we have the winter scenes facing the north wall which was associated in the medieval period with notions of the devil and evil. And we have the scenes of summer, rogation and harvesting facing the east end of the church, the chancel and the nave of the body. So the space itself, I 
would contend affects how we should understand or read the object. It affects how the font as an object codifies that space. So to go back to Lefebvre's conceptual triad of space, we have a conception of space, which could be the classical inspired motifs the iconography is alluding to. We have spatial practice, which is the movement in the church through the south door into the nave, etc., out through the north door. And we have the object as experienced in lived space, which of course is a combination of those two, of conceived and uh, perceived or experienced. Now I don't really have time to go into any more detail here, but again, I think this is really key. But in summary, what I think this object's doing in this space is it's placing value on a particular way of living. It's saying that actually to lead a good Christian life, to pick up, the, to follow the positive aspects of a good Christian life, you need to be performing in certain, you need to be doing certain types of spatial activities, such as harvesting, sowing, taking part in rogation, etc. And what it's doing is it's codifying a space, but it's also implanting into the onlooker conceptions as to how to behave in a space outside the church. Now, if you look at the medieval farming, if you look at medieval farming practices, it really is all about rhythms, okay? So it's set times of the year, you do set things. The maintenance of that open field system, which would have characterized the surrounding landscape, depended upon the community working as one to do things in tandem at roughly the same time. So the conceptions arising out of this object, or arising out of reading the object within the space of the church, of course are shaping practice in the landscape outside. Now I don't have time to go into any more detail, but um, basically, as the medieval period progresses, you start to get a divergence between lived space and conceptions of space in artwork. And I think that, in part, not entirely, contributes to the breakdown of medieval systems of agricultural practice. So thank you for listening. And uh, again, sorry for being a very rushed run through of uh, medieval, medieval farming practice. Thank you.